So look at the first. God made him. Now, that's true of everyone, of course. Any life is owing to God. But the point is underlined here. Because notice, Rebecca, like Sarah before her, is barren. Isaac gets married when he's 40. The twins are born when he's 60. So 20 years, not quite as long as Abraham and Sarah had to wait, but 20 years of their married life, Rebecca is barren. Notice Isaac and Rebecca don't resort to another woman. They're the only patriarch to be truly monogamous. They're not going to try some other way, some other maidservant. This is going to take a miracle. So Isaac prays. You see that in verse 21. And the Lord granted his prayer. Of course, every new life is from God. All of this, you have children. You know, this is a great gift from God. God is the maker of us all. But this is a unique point, one that we are not meant to forget. We could say, in a sense, God made these twins ex nihilo, out of nothing, because by emphasizing that the couple was unable on their own to have children, God is telling us, however the science was not working, the raw material was not there in Isaac and Rebecca to make this work. So we are meant to see these children, this was not the inevitable outworking of ordinary biological function. Of course, we realize children are a gift, but there's a sort of, yeah, this is what you thought would happen. And you get married and you come together and then you have kids. And that's what people grow up thinking. So many of you have stories that were otherwise. It's very difficult or even unable it took many, many years. Here it took 20 to the point where Isaac and Rebecca knew that this was not going to work just by their own natural function. If they were to have children, it would require a supernatural birth. One response is to simply give thanks for life. We shouldn't be here. That's what the Israelites should have remembered. All those centuries later, when they swelled to be millions in number, if they looked back to the story of Jacob's birth, they would remember, we should not be here. Just biologically, naturally, we shouldn't be here. By the laws of nature, we would not exist. We were not supposed to happen. Our lives are a gift, and that's good however we were born. That's good for all of us to remember and give thanks. And even more profoundly than that, they were to remember on a spiritual level, they came into being because God willed them to come into being. We owe our existence as God's people to his power his mercy, his will. Here's how the Gospel of John puts it. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you're here, and you are, I see you, <laughs> that's amazing. If you're here, and you're a sincere, born-again Christian, that's doubly amazing. That's a miracle on par with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, on par with Isaac and Rebecca having children after 20 years when they had no biological rationale that they would have children, and God said, let there be life, and there was life. It sounds so prosaic, but if we believe that God made us, and that he gave us life once, spiritual life again, that has massive implications. 
If your existence is owing to the creation of God, that means we ought to be grateful people. It means we ought to be humble people, obedient people. It means that we say, I am not my own, but I belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. It means that God tells you how to use your body. It means that God establishes your identity. We don't establish it for ourselves, let alone defining God and his identity. It means that every person in this room who truly belongs to Christ is a miracle of supernatural sovereign grace. This is the point. They were to remember our mother, great, 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 great grandmother Rebecca, her womb was as good as dead. But here we are. And they were then to think our spiritual lives were as good as dead. But here we are. Because of God, God called into existence the things that were not. He made us. And if we don't get this right, he made you. Not the it, infinite virtually processes of random chance, but God made you, knew you, formed you. And it sets us on a trajectory of thankfulness, obedience, humility, and faith. Remember, this story is done. Remember where you came from. God made you by a miracle. And then here's the second. Not just did God make you. He chose you. The story of these twins and their gestation and their birth was to explain in part the lifelong tension between Esau and Jacob and the centuries-long conflict between the Edomites and the Israelites. So part of this is to explain why, why did Jacob and Ishmael, why did they have such a hard time? Why do we have such a hard time with the Edomites? Well, you see it here from the very beginning, verse 22. The children struggled within her. And just notice, as an aside, the children, they don't become children if we choose to birth them. They are children from the moment of conception, not a clump of cells, not yet to be born, not simply beings with fetal heartbeat. They are children. And these children struggled within her. It's a strong verb. Some commentators say you could translate it. They were crushing each other. So just take heart. You have brothers. You have sons crushing each other. And you just say, just being biblical, mom. <laughs> well, from the very beginning in their life, there's a, there's a violent collision with these twins, so much so that Rebecca says in verse 22, Why? What's going on? This is more than just, oh, here, Isaac, come. Isaac, so the, the, they're moving. Feel this. You feel that leg? It's, I got to lay down. They're hurting each other and hurting me. What is happening? This is, this is beyond just cute baby movements. And so the Lord comes to her. You have two nations in your womb, two peoples, and they're going to be divided. And one will be stronger than the other and the older is going to serve the younger. It was a precursor of things to come. Have we not seen many times already, and will continue to see in the book of Genesis, families fight. Now, we don't want it to be so. We want to grow and we want to love one another, but there's at least some small comfort. The Bible's realistic. This book about origins, about beginnings, it's about a lot of things. It's about blessing, it's about promise, but it's also about families fighting all the time. Cain and Abel, the sons of Noah, Abraham and Lot, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Laban, Joseph and his older brothers. There's lots of family conflict. 
And in verse 23, we read that the natural order of things is going to be overturned. One of many surprising reversals in Genesis. Cain was older, his offerings rejected, Abel's accepted. Then, as Cain's banished, Abel's killed, the youngest brother, Seth, becomes the chosen line. Ishmael was older than Isaac, but Isaac is the promised line. Rachel is chosen instead of her older sister, Leah. Joseph, instead of his older brothers, even Judah instead of Reuben. It's a common theme in the Bible and a common theme in Genesis. God often, you might even say, usually does things in ways you don't expect. And all throughout the book of Genesis, you go, well, that's different. I didn't see that coming until you learn the pattern and expect the unexpected. But more important than simply overturning the cultural expectations for the firstborn, this is a story about election. For all the years and the centuries afterward, the Israelites were meant to think. Let's not forget how we got here. Why are we special of all the people on earth? Why are we God's treasured possession? Why are we a holy nation? Why are we a royal priesthood? And the answer is right here in their origin story, because God, because God chose you. Lest they say, well, it must be a family connection. Nope, can't say that, same mother. Well, maybe it's an, it's an ethnic thing. Nope, can't say that. Both Shemites. Well, surely there was something deep down that we had done, just some little bitty thing we had done to make ourselves a little more deserving. God says, nope, you can't do that because this was before you were born, before you had done anything good or bad. I said Jacob will be mine. Paul famously makes this exact point and relates it to all Christians in Romans 9. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Yes, it is essential that we understand, God wants us to understand, as a part of our origin story as a church, as Christians, the doctrine of election. You say, Pastor, really, this is so divisive and it's difficult and a lot of Christians see it different ways. Do we have to talk about it? Well, we talk about things when they're in the Bible. And here it's, it's right here in front of us. And I know I've had all sorts of conversations. I have my own questions. I know this is a difficult doctrine. It raises difficult questions. Well, God's sovereign, what about human responsibility? Yes, well, both of those things are true. And well, what about my family members? And what about the fairness? And there's lots of questions that you have. And this is not the theology class or the Romans 9 sermon to go into all of those questions and answers. It is, however, to make sure we do not miss the larger point. As you sit here this morning and you're a Christian, if you're a Christian or or take it collectively as a church, as God's people, and you think to yourself, why am I a Christian? I know lots of people that aren't. Why are we singing songs to Jesus this morning? Most people, even in Charlotte, aren't doing that. Why are we? How did we get here? Where did we come from? What is our origin story? And ultimately, there are only two options. Either you got here 
because there's something, however small, in you that was more worthy, more deserving, more spiritual, or the ultimate answer is God. God chose us. God elected us. God put his love upon us. Isn't that what we were singing in the hymn? Why was I made to hear your voice and enter while there's room, while thousands make a wretched choice? Why are so many making a wretched choice? And I'm here, God. Because God chose you. Now, the, the wrong response is to say, well, I guess it's just all fatalism. The right response, as you think about loved ones in your life who don't know Jesus, is, well, I guess there's hope for all of us because it doesn't ultimately depend upon me. Yes, I must exercise faith, but I only can do that if God gives me and grants me the gift of faith. Jesus says, you cannot come unless the Father draws. You simply will not do it. But then he also says, and he will never cast anyone out. So don't think you ever come to Jesus and Jesus says, let me check my list. Mm -mm, Sorry, not chosen. No, he says, you came. You know why you came? Because I chose you. I chose you before the foundation of the world. That's why you came. And I'm so glad you came and I will never cast you out. God made you. God chose you. That's the story. How did we get here? Yes, there's other parts of the story. There's other secondary causation in the story, but that explains our story. And so we're meant to see, just like the Israelites were, it's not because of your family. I hope you don't think that being a Christian is just, it's just a family thing. Kids, young people, so glad if you have parents who bring you to church and raise you in the Lord. Or you, maybe you go to a Christian school or your parents at home teach you the Bible. That's wonderful. That's good. You want to follow in their footsteps. But you do need to make it your own. You, you, you can't just say, well, this is, my, my family kind of does this. You say, I, I, I'm not here ultimately because this is a family thing. Though God loves us in our families, you certainly cannot think this is somehow an ethnic thing. Your race, your ethnicity, the color of your skin does not make you one bit closer nor one bit farther away from God and his mercy. And it is not anything you have done. It's not even God, well, he looked into the future to see that you would make some really good decisions. There's nothing about that here. Quite the opposite. Paul makes just the opposite conclusion. The reason why this choice happens here, because God doesn't look and say, well, Jacob, in fact, if you know the rest of Genesis, you know, Jacob, he's not so great a lot of the time. He's got a lot to learn. His name means trickster, but God said, I will set my affection upon you. So it's not anything you've done. It wasn't your works. It was God's call. It wasn't your purpose that started this story. It was God's plan. You must remember, we must remember as God's people where we have come from. God made us. He chose us. Listen, the world is so pressing in to shape you into its image. And the world is always telling stories. The world doesn't come usually with, here, here's a tract of propositions and I want you to reject Christian ones and I want you to believe these propositions. No, that would be too obvious. The world tells us stories. And the world is telling you a story of where you are from, how you got here and where you are going. And so many of those stories in the world are lies. And actually, it's worse than that. If they were lies, it would be obvious. They're often half-truths, which are the worst kinds of lies. And so you must be absolutely clear that you were made through Christ, you were chosen in Christ, you were saved by Christ, you will live for eternity with Christ, You belong to Christ, you believe in Christ, you obey in everything 
Christ. That's our story. And it explains how we got here. And it explains where we are going. So as you think about our national story, you think about your own personal family story, don't miss the far more important spiritual story of how you got here. Because in those moments where things are going so well, you're meant to remember, okay, I I can't pat myself on the back. Uh, If I'm moving from strength to strength in God's story, it's because God made me and God chose me. And then in those moments, in the darkest, deepest well, say, I don't see how this is going to end, but God made me. God chose me. It gives humility in the moments of prosperity, and it gives hope in the moments of adversity to remember who you are and where you're from and where you're going. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for your word, which tells us the real story amidst so many false stories, the story we need, and we pray that we would not forget it. And as we come to your table, may you remind us once again the story you have called us to inhabit and to enjoy and promise to us forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.